Could we uh, call the meeting to order? Good morning, everybody. Um, listen, we have, uh, we have a long, long meeting today, very uh, substantive. Want to make sure we leave uh, room for both the presentations of the letters and any discussion that might ensue. But first, as always, uh, Secretary Locke, uh, we'd very much like to hear your perspectives on uh, where we are, where we should go, and, I, and it's my understanding you might be commenting a little bit on today's agenda to sort of tee it up, but we'd appreciate that very much. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Jim, and to everyone, uh, thank you for uh, uh, attending. I know everyone, we've got some members of the, the Hill, of the Congress with us as well, and so it's great to, to see our, our elected officials uh, uh, and um, on, a non, on a bipartisan basis, really focusing on increasing exports. We have a jam-packed agenda, so let me just uh, uh, start with just a few comments. Again, thank you, everyone, for uh, traveling great distances and adjusting your schedules to be here. We also have numerous members of the, of the uh, a president's cabinet and uh, agencies involved in exports, and we'll be hearing uh, from them throughout the day. I want to let you indicate that uh, um, all the letters that have been submitted and, and the recommendations that have been submitted, we are in fact putting them into a, a uh, document uh, and with an action plan, and we will be reporting to you regularly the actual progress. Uh, uh, toward implementation and uh, of your recommendations so that you're, I want to assure you that your work is not going uh, uh, into a book that, or a, a binder that sits on a shelf. We are using it as an action plan with deliverables right. and we will be reporting back uh, on exactly our progress. I want to let you know that um, uh, throughout uh, 2010 exports have uh, been up substantially. Exports were up uh, 17 percent over 2009, uh, and uh, uh, we want to thank companies like yours uh, for being involved in that and playing a key role. Uh, yesterday's report also showed that U.S. exports of goods and services in January increased mm. 2.7 percent over December. Uh, it was the highest level of monthly exports on record, uh, with record exports in both goods and in services. Uh, now, our trade deficit uh, for January uh, increased also to $46 uh, billion. That's an increase of about 15 percent over the previous month. But it's really important to note that 60 percent of that deficit, that monthly trade deficit, was from the imports of petroleum. And so, uh, obviously, we need to continue to focus on clean energy uh, uh, and, uh, and become less reliant on petroleum imports into the United States. Meanwhile, the Commerce Department and all the other federal agencies, uh, many of them represented here around the table today, are very active in helping U.S. companies export uh, in two areas in particular. Uh, number one, uh, we're all involved in helping businesses, especially the small, medium-sized companies, learn of the incredible services uh, that the federal government offers to help them export whether it's Small Business Administration, Export-Import Bank, uh, focusing on enforcement from the U.S. Uh, Trade Representative's Office to our foreign commercial people at the Department of Commerce, where we have people stationed in 77 countries around the world whose sole job is to find buyers and customers for those made in USA uh, goods and services. Uh, and uh, we have been embarked on a, uh, every month uh, a road show going around the United States working with the mayors and the governors in form and hosting these large conferences, especially targeted to small, medium-sized companies, informing them of these services. And we're hearing feedback uh, from the chambers and others, for instance, that a lot of these companies don't even know that Export-Import Bank offers a, uh, a service to guarantee payment by these foreign buyers so that these medium-small companies can feel comfortable selling uh, their products, uh, whether to Vietnam or to Hungary. Uh, we're also working with companies like uh, UPS uh, and the National Association of Manufacturers uh, uh, to identify their customers who are under-exporting. We have some 1% um, uh, of U.S. companies export, and of that 1%, 58% export to only one country, typically Mexico or Canada. And so, for instance, UPS has an incredible database that can identify and sort uh, these companies by destination, uh, frequency of a shipment, dollar value, uh, type of goods, uh, and UPS and, and even FedEx and the Postal Service are trying to identify those companies that they think would uh, uh, be ripe uh, 
uh, to uh, uh, use our services uh, to uh, uh, export to two or three additional countries. So I want to thank uh, uh, UPS for incredible leadership and, and a great partnership uh, there. I think uh, you keep telling me, was it for every additional 22 packages per day that UPS ships, that's one additional job. So working with UPS is a win-win, gives them more business and helps our U.S. companies sell more, creating more jobs throughout the economy and helps us achieve the President's uh, objective of uh, doubling exports over the next uh, uh, five years. Uh, Commerce Department has led some 35 trade missions uh, last year. That's an all-time record. I just came back from a trade mission uh, to India uh, with 24 medium-sized uh, and small companies as well as some, some of you and your big companies here focusing on high technology and following up on the President's very successful historic visit to India two months ago uh, and uh, taking advantage of some of the new opportunities uh, given the President's announcement of uh, export control reforms between the United States and India. Uh, we're also very active uh, uh, in knocking down trade barriers for U.S. Uh, companies, from the U.S. Trade Representative's Office to the Commerce Department. Uh, we're also, for instance, and, and Ambassador Kirk can talk more about it uh, later, uh, but just testifying before the Hill the other day about the U.S.-Korea Free Trade Agreement. Uh, that will uh, enable U.S. companies to sell some $11 billion uh, in uh, U.S. exports and supporting some 70,000 jobs uh, in the process. And we're confident that uh, once it passes, uh, they, that uh, uh, it will really have enormous benefits for U.S. companies. And of course, when you have Ford Motor Company and, and also uh, uh, UAW supporting it, it, must be a really good deal. And of course, the opportunities for services is even, is even uh, more substantial beyond uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the opportunities uh, for uh, manufactured goods. Uh, but uh, trade, representatives, trade Representatives Office and Commerce Department are also working on the tariff and non-tariff barriers that we face, especially with issues like intellectual property rights and protection. And uh, Ambassador Kirk and I uh, were very involved in the December meeting of the uh, Joint Commerce uh, Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade involving China, in which we were able to really get additional commitments on enforcement of intellectual property rights by the Chinese, as well as uh, uh, delinking uh, indigenous innovation from their government procurement uh, work. Agriculture, uh, all-time high in exports last year, uh, with a huge trade surplus, expected to be even higher this coming year in 2011. Export-Import Bank uh, had a record high of some $24.5 billion worth of financing, supporting some 230,000 jobs. Uh, travel tourism, uh, foreign visitors to the United States, uh, jumped up, I think, uh, what is it, about uh, 11 or 12 percent uh, uh, in 2010 over 2009. 2009 was a terrible year, so uh, we've had a, raw, a strong uh, resurgence in 2010 and 2011 is expected to continue to grow. And so a lot of jobs of, uh, associated with foreign tourism into the United States. So with that, uh, let me just say that uh, uh, we're working very, very hard across all the agencies uh, to promote uh, U.S. companies exporting from our advocacy center, helping yeah. sell Boeing airplanes and GE turbines and uh, Caterpillar uh, uh, equipment uh, to working with small and medium-sized companies. Again. Uh, and of course, Xerox devices, yes, yes, yes. And uh, <laughs> what other companies do you want me to promote here? Huh? <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're really pleased to be working with all of you. And uh, we've got a, um, a jam-packed agenda. And again, I want to assure you that the work product and the recommendations and the letters that you submit are uh, being acted on, ca uh, cataloged, and we will be reporting to you our apps, uh, our uh, the, the milestones and the deliverables and the progress made with respect to each of those recommendations. Okay. Turn it back over to you, Jim. Okay, Gary. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, uh, and let me just say, uh, I should have said at the beginning that all of us in the private sector uh, are very, very pleased to be here. And the energy that you've provided us in return, some of our recommendations, some of our thoughts, really important. And so thank you for that. And I also would like to welcome the publicly elected officials in the, in the administration uh, leadership that will be here to join us. I see Ambassador Kirk down at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the table, and uh, which just reminds us that we all got to do this together to get to the goals that we're all going for. And, and listen, 22,000 packages means another 
747-400 freighter. <laughs> okay, so so we, that that whole that whole series of impacts was not lost on me. My my partner in crime, Ursula. Do you have any comments before we charge ahead? Yes. Yeah, just yeah. just yeah. Um, I wanted to thank um, all who. Thank you. I wanted to thank all who joined us last night um, for the services caucus reception. Um, it was actually fun, well attended, um, very active and fun. And I want a special thank you to Congressman Pritchard for hosting it uh, for us and saying some kind words. It was good to see you there and for all the PEC members who were there as well. It's an important part of the PEC's mission and a place that we actually don't focus enough on and we're starting to turn up the energy um, on, which is services exports, a big deal for us. Um, as we begin our work in 2011, I know that we're all hopeful on what you spoke about, uh, Senator Secretary Locke, which is meaningful progress. Um, good, good baseline that we had in 2010 and the start. You'll hear s uh, some more recommendations today, and now we're on to let's start uh, implementing, making progress. Um, and that'll be good. We remain focused and energetic. Thank you, Ursula. Uh, Ed, we want to get on to the letters, just pausing for one, one second to uh, just a personal note, and I think one that reflects uh, the views of everybody in the room. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary Locke. Your leadership uh, over the last few years has been critical for our country as well as for this particular initiative, and I wish you well. Uh, may your best days in the past be your worst days in the future in your new role. <laughs> That's an old Irish proverb I've been told. I think I, like all Irishmen, I just made it up. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but best of luck and thank you for your leadership. It's really meant a lot to the country and meant a lot to the big state. So okay. let me just uh, say yeah, that sure, uh, once a Commerce Secretary, always a Commerce Secretary, and, and uh, uh, assuming the Senate uh, uh, confirms the nomination to be ambassador to China, we, we want to really uh, help you all sell your, gotcha. uh, your goods and services into China. Incredible market. And uh, so I'm just, it's really an extension uh, uh, of the work of Commerce, but now focused on one particular country. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, just before we get on with the letters, I, I, I see Secretary Solis is here. Did, did you want to make a quick comment before we before we dove into the? Thank you. Yeah, and then I think Administrator Mills wanted to say something as well. Thank so we'll, you, uh, Jim, and and thank you to my colleagues, cabinet members, and all of you, the elected officials, and all the business community and and staff and everyone. It's it's a pleasure to be here, and I am very enthusiastic to see that the administration is is moving now ahead on the free trade agreements. I'm very. Uh, very involved with USTR, with our partners in, in um, State Department and with this administration and hope to continue to see that we make progress on worker protections and also increasing uh, viability for uh, making sure that, that we're able to have that, that uh, open movement of goods back and forth and also looking forward to, to working with you closely on opportunities with the Department of Labor. And if I could just briefly go, sure. go quickly on this. The uh, Workforce Investment Act that some of you may be aware of or, or not aware of is a, is a structure that's been in place now for a few decades. And basically, it provides services to businesses and importantly for workers. And most of you I know are very concerned about the caliber of the workforce and the type of individuals that may not be adequately trained or prepared at this time to move in uh, move into some of your sectors. I'm telling, I want to tell you that we have opportunities and services available. We uh, receive funding through the administration for approximately $2 billion to work with community colleges through the Trade Adjustment Assistance TAA program. And the effort is to really uh, hunker down and work with businesses to have a better bridge in terms of preparing the workforce with your input, your ideas, and my hope is that we can really come out with some good concrete examples of how that can happen. Some of you have already worked with us on that, but I, I'm hearing a lot that we need, to, we need to actually have experts from your industry helping us design curriculum with the community colleges and making a more a seamless effort there to make sure that we get the best qualified individuals trained. And not everyone is, as, as we know, is going to go directly to a four-year university. Some will choose to go into trades, I hope. And I I'm really about focusing in on manufacturing jobs. Those are good jobs, they're middle class jobs, they pay well, yeah. 
And I really do see a hunger out there in our communities to know more about what that means in terms of renewable energy, high tech, health care, broadband, and areas where we can work together. So I'm, I'm opening that up for you all to have a conversation with us. Uh, we hope to work through reauthorization of the Workforce Investment Act, and I'm glad to see that we have uh, members on both sides of the aisle here so we can have those discussions because we do have to fix the system, and I think we do have to hear loud and clear what businesses uh, are thinking, what they're doing. You're the ones who create the jobs, not the federal government. So please contact us. Well, I, I can personally attest to the effectiveness of these local partnerships because Boeing has a couple of them with you. and. Uh, uh, we'd be very glad to put this into the into into uh, consideration on a number of our initiatives. So we'll we be delighted to work with you. It's important work. So, Ambassador Mills, uh, <laughs> Administrator Mills, excuse me. Thanks very much. And, uh, we have uh, handed out in front of you a short brief on um, the small business uh, part of exports, and I, I want to. You'll hear later from Jean and Mary, who really have. Uh, brought this into a recommendation. But I want to just lay the uh, groundwork here for two minutes. As all of you know, um, small businesses are going to be a critical part of achieving our goal of doubling um, these, uh, these exports. And as we go on, how are we going to actually take these uh, um, small businesses, of which there are 28 million, and make sure that they have the access uh, to the export opportunities. Right now, the situation is that small businesses, as you know, create two out of three of the jobs. And half of the people who work in this country own or work for a small business. So if we're going to take exports and drive jobs, we're going to have to think about how the numbers work for small business. It turns out that out of these millions of small businesses, only 250,000 actually export. And if you look at how small businesses are laid out, there are, are 28 million, only 6 million of them have employees. And of those, many who have employees actually compete in their local markets. So probably only an estimated 2 million have goods and services that are traded outside their local markets. Still, out of 2 million, 250,000 actually export. So how do we take that? We have a lot of potential there. Those 250,000 now account for 30% of all merchandise exports. And they're the fastest growing segments. Nonetheless, as Gary said in the beginning, um, most of them only export to one country, and that one country is one of three or four countries. Canada, Mexico, I don't even know what the other two are. So the question is, how can we take uh, the funnel bring more in, and then how can we take those who are already exporting and export to more, more people? What we're actually doing inside the administration now is um, working in a coordinated effort through what we call TPCC, the Trade Promotion Coordinating Committee. And it does, um, uh, Gary runs it, and Francisco and others in commerce um, uh, have long run this organization. We run the Small Business Working Group. And I just want to give you a small view as to the approach that's active, because many of you can help us by engaging with us in, in some of these pieces. We have many, many agencies involved. You'll see it's Commerce, it's Import-Export Bank, it's Department of Agriculture, it's Energy, it's Department of State and uh, Transportation. And we have made a sort of four-pronged um, path forward. The first is to get more small businesses in the funnel. We deal with small businesses every day, and maybe they haven't thought about exporting. The second is when we've got them interested in exporting, we prepare them to export. So there's a whole series of uh, training and education and walking them basically hand in hand, hand uh, through, through the process. And the third is to connect them to export opportunities. We have trade missions uh, that Gary has described. We've got matchmaking events. Um, but that's, I think, another piece of the bottleneck. A lot of you are going to be able to help us pull businesses through that. And the third is to support them. Uh, the fourth is to support them once they've started exporting. That's where our financial products come in, Import-Export Bank as well. So looking on the right side of this, there are actually three kinds of exporters that we've identified. What we call passive exporters, these are folks who 
have a small business, they might put up their website, and what do you know, they're doing business all around the world. Then we've got uh, supply chain, and this is something I really, um, this probably is the single most important point I wanna make, which is that lots of you in this room have a supply chain. They need to be export ready. If you um, build a plant somewhere else, we need to be able to have them ship their components overseas to those plants. If you are pulling product through and exporting it, in some ways they're already involved in an export supply chain. And the last is what we call independent exporters, which are those who manufacture goods and services, which could have a market outside the US, but they don't have the pathway forward. They don't have a distribution system in these other countries, and we need to think about uh, how we do that. So we have um, activities around each of these areas uh, where we can use your help. We actually have a national outreach campaign, which is a broad campaign to think about export opportunities. We have a set of um, activities, uh, export outreach teams, where throughout the administration we have coordinated um, with between agencies and also particularly with state activities. And many of you are involved in your local state export um, Council, and this is uh, a connection that we have um, made to greater and greater degree in order to make sure that everybody knows about the federal government programs that are out there. It doesn't do them any good if they can't get access. We've also done a number of things in the um, uh, countries abroad, try to make better use of both our State Department assets and our Commerce Department assets. This is where Gary's talked about the gold key, you know, where a small company will actually get walked around to marketing opportunities. We need to think about other ways we can uh, give distribution access to small companies who don't have that kind of uh, overhead that they can create their own. And the last thing I want to mention is that um, there's a specific program that I'd like you all to, to think about and watch for. Uh, in the states where you operate. We have um, been given in the Small Business Jobs Bill the ability to run a competition to deliver $90 million to state export offices. And we made it a competition uh, so that those states, those governors, it will be done one application per state, those governors will come together with those people in their state that export, so it could be yourselves, other big companies. It would usually be the state export offices. It would be our um, support facilities at Commerce and the SBA and Import-Export Bank. And they'll make an application as to how they will use this funding. And we will uh, award it in a competitive uh, process. So that um, announcement went out about two weeks ago. We are looking for uh, governors and your your companies to engage actively. And I think there's many opportunities around supply chain to uh, fund some really targeted initiatives that are, are a little bit new and different and that might um, galvanize some of the small business activity in each of your areas. So we'll look forward to that. Well, thank, thank you very you. much for your comments. Just one general comment. Uh, you, you know, the initiative that we've got wants to line up with you totally. and so. We're just going to keep working together. Secondly, you just reminded me, uh, most of the exports are in our supply chains, small businesses, and we have to make sure their voices are heard in the FTA discussion. And it's one thing we've said to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Let's say it to ourselves again, okay? That's a good reminder. I appreciate that very much. Okay, let's get on with the, with the letters. Um, the first letter of importance, I think Pat, Pat Wirtz, where's Pat? I'm here. Uh, transportation infrastructure. Very good. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm very pleased to present the uh, letter on behalf of the subcommittee on manufacturing services and agriculture. Our key message of this letter, which I'll be succinct about, is that America's transportation infrastructure is America's export infrastructure. So it, whether it's our highways, our railways, our ports, our bridges, our runways, air traffic control systems, uh, they are really the first link in a very long global supply chain. So just some very brief data. Uh, freight rail moves goods in and out of states, 49 out of the 50 states. Trucks move 70 percent 
of all U.S. freight. Ships and barges carry 60 percent of U.S. grain out of just one location, the mouth of the Mississippi River. Passenger and cargo airlines transport nearly 20 percent of all U.S. goods in 2009. And U.S. ports support directly and indirectly more than 13 million American jobs. So the effort of this subcommittee has five recommendations, and I'll just briefly cover them. The first is that the Department of Transportation do a top-down review of the nation's export infrastructure chain to determine the weaknesses and the choke points. And then armed with informa this information, local, state, and federal agencies and the private sector do a collaboration effort to enhance those opportunities. The second recommendation is that the administration identify export infrastructure corridors. And these corridors can then build interagency and intergovernmental teams to enhance those developments of the corridors. The private sector should be part of that and is ready to do its part as well. The third recommendation relates to the long list of infrastructure projects that are already on the dockets. We believe the government should take into account a new criteria or a higher priority criteria, and that is the positive impact on exports in order to evaluate and prioritize this long list of transportation uh, infrastructure projects so that, and we have a metric in the letter, so that metrics can be used to advance and prioritize those, those uh, projects that do have export, higher export potential. The fourth recommendation is to develop a comprehensive funding strategy ensuring that the transportation trust funds, now these are trust funds that are already in existence, are used for infrastructure development and not for simply deficit reduction. We encourage also the establishment of a national infrastructure bank. And then the last recommendation is about some longer term structural needs, and those are covered in the letter, uh, enumerated in the letter, and I won't, won't cover here. We believe these policy suggestions can be readily applied to the existing infrastructure funding programs. I think that's important to note. And so in closing, uh, we, I would just like to say that the markets around the world are definitely more eager than ever to obtain American goods. And we think investment in this transportation, this first link in the chain, is how those goods get to market. And we believe it will definitely support the, uh, the overall goal and our collective vision to double exports by 2015. Thank you. Th thanks, Pat. I think, I think there were two others that would like to weigh in briefly. Senator Wyden, I think, would like to make a comment, and then Alan Malai. Ah, you, Senator Stabenow, and then Alan, cleanup hitter. Let's see here. But, well, good morning. And I wanted to just make a couple of points. Um, I think this is a really excellent recommendation. I did want to, um, with my Michigan hat on, uh, just note that approximately 28 percent of the surface transportation um, trade goes through uh, Detroit Windsor. And so that's very important. I'm, I'm very pleased to see that was included as part of this. Is, this is a, a major um, hub for us, and the idea of creating hubs, I think, is also very, very important. Um, we will be putting together a transportation bill, uh, multiple-year multiple transportation bill this year. It's important that your voices be involved in that and the aspect of exports and the importance of leveraging what we do on transportation is important. The final thing I just wanted to mention, we just recently in the Senate passed a, an FAA modernization bill. It's not yet passed in the House. We assume it will, but um, I think if all of us who fly really knew how outdated the, the air traffic control system was, we'd drive probably, because uh, we uh, use GPS and everything, including our handheld devices, and yet do not use it in air traffic control. So the next gen system, which would move to GPS, is a critical part of FAA reform. We have got to get there. A 20 percent reduction in delays alone using that system. And I would just encourage, just as an aside, that uh, to the extent that you can create a sense of urgency about this, we're way behind on this. And uh, I, I think that's, that, that's something that we have worked on, we're finally seeing it move, and we need to get it done. As you know, Jim. <laughs> Jim, thank you. And Senator Stabenow makes the important point that this is a good letter, A, and B, it's especially timely because we've got the transportation bill coming up. Here is going to be the single biggest challenge on this transportation bill and trying to 
in effect legislate your uh, recommendations, and that is to generate bipartisan support for new approaches for generating revenue. That's what's coming up in hearing after hearing after hearing. And to the extent we can take these recommendations and build on that, that's how we're going to get them enacted into law. Here's an example. Some of you know that I have tried for many years to get the government into bonding for transportation. And the Build America bonds over the year and a half we had them in the Recovery Act were wildly successful. We sold about $180 billion worth of Build America bonds. It's just a breathtaking sum. Folks have been concerned that they've been popular and have been used for other circumstances. So this time, it looks like there will be bipartisan support to rebrand them and get them reserved just for transportation, only for transportation. And to the extent we're trying to build bipartisan support, we're going to rename them as well. We're going to call them TRIPS bonds, Transportation and Regional Infrastructure Bonds, just to be able to send the message that as we try to deal with this biggest challenge, finding new revenue for transportation, we want to show that we're going to use the private sector to take the lead. It's just going to be for the transportation issues you're concerned about. And to the extent we can pick up on that message, I think, Jim, that's a chance to get this enacted into law. Because otherwise, I happen to be very interested in the infrastructure bank concept. It's been hard to get bipartisan support for it to date. Let's keep our eye on what it's going to take to get these things enacted into law. I think TRIPS bonds already is pretty much ready to go. Thanks. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, echo uh, Senator Stabenow's comments earlier, uh, especially the border crossings with uh, Canada and also with Mexico. And the uh, corridor between uh, uh, Detroit and Michigan or Ontario and uh, uh, Michigan and the U.S. and Canada is probably the biggest value corridor that we have in the United States. Also, um, the transportation system and the interface with Mexico and, of course, east and west uh, around the world. So I'd like to just really support this, this letter of recommendation. Also, I'd like to um, uh, also support the further use of GPS, not only the air traffic control system, but the Boeing airplanes are ready and the Ford cars are ready. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. Uh, Thanks, Alan. Thanks so thank you much. very much. And you, you have built both. <laughs> uh, listen, um, without ob objection, I'm prepared to adopt the letter. Okay, we'll adopt a letter, move on to the second one. Uh, second one is on trade logistics. Scott Davis. Yes, Mr. UPS. Chairman. We actually have three letters coming out of the yeah. trade promotion uh, subcommittee. And I will kick off the first one. This calls for presidential leadership on the timely development and implementation of an automated single window to include exports to complement the work already being done on imports. A single window the system allows businesses to input information with a single entry to fulfill all the import or export related regulatory requirements. This window will allow over 40 government agencies that currently have a trade related mandate to share all relevant information in a safe, real time environment. For example, uh, an exporter or importer will be able to make just one filing to the U.S. government and receive all the necessary clearances. This could involve a variety of agencies, including the FDA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Office of Foreign Assets Control, BIS, and Department of Transportation, all able to access information they need in just one filing. By creating a single filing, the U.S. government will increase the timeliness, transparency, compliance, and security of trade. These efforts will aid trade facilitation in and out of the U.S. The benefits will be passed along to all businesses, including SMEs as they'll be able to take advantage of the streamlined processes. So we recommend the administration work with the various stakeholders, including DHS, Customs and Border Protection, USTR, USDA, Treasury, and the Department of Commerce to reinvigorate the creation of a single window to create a seamless air export process. And for all of us who have been involved in, in, this, in this use, Customs cost an awful lot between 5 and 15 percent of the cost of a shipment, which is ridiculous. And I think the idea of being able to 
for shippers to access you know one window today they they go to several agencies and go to one aide just to one window and custom shares that information with the other agencies would be a big big benefit to to all shippers i think as we move forward and again just one of the thing that the focus generally for most countries is on import for a variety of reasons one you, you collect duties and taxes so you want to make sure you have the, the best software uh, you also security as doug over there knows we've worked a lot with him lately on the security issues so the focus generally is on imports, but a lot of that same software can be used on exports. So I think it makes an awful lot of sense. Both uh, cost and effectiveness. Tough to argue with. Are there any, any comments? So without objection, we'll uh, adopt the second letter. We have four, four more letters to go. Uh, Exim Bank's reauthorization. I see, I see Fred here who will listen with interest, but Raul? <laughs> Raul, do you want to lead off? Absolutely. And Fred will definitely listen with interest. <laughs> uh, I'm pleased to present the letter um, for reauthorizing the Exxon Bank on behalf of the Trade Promotion and Advocacy Subcommittee. Uh, it's important to note that due to limitations placed on the Exxon Bank, it operates far below the levels of other countries' official export credit agencies. Uh, as the chairman of the Exxon Bank, Fred himself regularly points out the bank is self-sustaining and therefore no longer requires annual funding from the Congress. Exim Bank has generated, in fact, billions of dollars in revenues to the U.S. Treasury through its transaction fees to customers. So therefore, we recommend that the administration and Congress uh, reauthorize the Exim Bank by September of 2011. Uh, we also recommend that the administration provide nominees and pushes to fill the vacancies within the Exim Bank's board as expediently as possible. The minimum required for a quorum to conduct business at the Exim Bank is three. If the nominees are not confirmed and in place by July, only the chairman will be in office and Exim will not be able to process possible transactions. With the level of financing currently at approximately $78 billion, the allowable financing cap of the Exim should be raised from 100 billion to a minimum of 200 billion, which would allow Exim to increase significantly its loans and guarantees annually. Exim's content regulations should be modified to better reflect the way goods and services are transformed and transacted in today's marketplace. Exim should take steps to make it easier for small and medium sized enterprises to access the bank's resources with the goal of doubling the bank's financing for SMEs over the next four years. And the bank should develop an action plan to address increased financing in the important sector of the U.S. economy, consistent with the Exim's stated desire to increase financing within the services sector. Those are the basic recommendations in the letter, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Raul. Any, any comments? Okay, very good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me just say, yes. uh, on behalf of the Treasury Department, Treasury, both on the single window issue where Treasury uh, chairs the interagency and on XM reauthorization, um, we very strongly appreciate the, uh, the recommendations in both uh, letters. Okay. And we look forward to working with the business community on this critically important reauthorization uh, of XM. So we'll look very carefully at the recommendations, yes, but sir. we really will need to work with you up on uh, the Hill to get this reauthorized in a timely manner. Uh, your support is uh, obviously very important. The, the only other thing I'd like to add is this, this small business credit facility uh, not only impacts standalone businesses, but also people in the supply chains of the big companies here. It's a very creative financing structure that gets them all paid much more quickly, uh, more, more quickly than you would pay them, okay? Just, just to give you an idea. Fred, do you want to comment on this? It's a very worthwhile program. I'll just comment for one second. Uh, we work closely with SBA, and frequently they can provide working capital loans. What we really do is provide accounts receivable insurance, and what uh, Jim is referring to is uh, on supply chain, uh, many exporters and the preponderance of small business exporters are really suppliers to larger companies. So we put in a supply chain finance program um, uh, to a launch customer, sorry, Jim, was uh, Case New Holland and uh, Caterpillar. But in this case, 
a small business can deliver its products and service, get paid within five days, where the company might normally pay them in 45 or 60 days. So it really adds huge liquidity to small businesses. So we are anxious to expand that much more so. And I know we're talking to Boeing, but the companies that are here, if we can, that's one way we can really make sure that small businesses get the liquidity they need uh, to export. Thank you, Fred, and thank you for your efforts. Um, any other comments? With none, we will adopt the letter. Um, obviously, the President's uh, Chief of Staff has just joined us. Bill is, is here. Um, you know, Bill's uh, pedigree on trade is about as good as it gets. Uh, uh, we all remember NAFTA working with Congress and then serving as Commerce Secretary. And uh, so, Bill, we're delighted to have you here to make a couple of comments uh, on our mission. And we'd let, like to take anything you have to say to heart. Let me um, be very brief, and I apologize for kind of stepping in. The things are kind of crazy today, obviously, with the tragedy in Japan, and, and uh, uh, we, we seem to the tsunami uh, potential in Hawaii uh, seems to the the, the tsunami uh, wave has gone through Hawaii, and there does not seem to be any enormous impact, which is extremely encouraging. There is always the possibility something may happen after, so people are watching that. And now there's some anticipation of what's going to happen on the West Coast. But I think the enormous fears uh, that were there um, hours ago, for some of us hours ago, um, has diminished greatly, which is which is quite a relief for all of us. The, the senators and representatives are here. I just want to say thank you to to the members of the PEC. Uh, all of you take time out of your schedules. Uh, you have to go through processes to get on these sort of uh, committees, which can be a pain in the neck. Uh, to all of you, I know everyone's smiling, saying, "Sometimes, why did I do this?" But um, uh, but the president really appreciates it, and and it's important to us. It's important that uh, we hear from from you, and and as we put together policies, and obviously the participation of the members of Congress who are here uh, is enormously helpful for them to hear from you, and I. My colleagues who are here. So, so let me just say we, we believe strongly that the economy is getting better. Obviously, trade and the importance of exports. The president's put out a hell of a challenge, uh, and we're on the on the path to, to meet that challenge, uh, albeit a difficult one. And especially as we get these blips like the energy price increase and what that may do to our to the economy and the troubles in certain parts of the world and the impact of just getting people a little more nervous. Uh, so, so your efforts are important. The, the directions, the policy changes you need. Trade has been. Jim said it. I, uh, I had the pleasure of helping President Clinton back in 1993 uh, pass NAFTA. I was six foot three, and I had a full head of hair. And, uh, <laughs> it, both of those went away very quickly. Um, but I'm still here. Um, anyways, um, it, it remains a difficult issue. I said yesterday at the BRT that I, I do believe the business community is, you know, does not view this except when there's a fight as an ongoing major issue. Seventy percent of the American people, according to the Wall Street Journal, uh, has a problem with trade. Uh, we're, we've taken a very aggressive enforcement uh, position in this administration on issues. Oftentimes, the business community loves to hear that, but then when you know, we do it in China or take some strong action on another country. People get a little nervous and they're not willing to kind of join in because they don't want to tick off the uh, governments in these other countries because of the enormous business you may do in those countries. So at times there's a little schizophrenia also with the business community, how far they want us to go on some of these things. Uh, but I think we have to acknowledge the fact that none of us have made great progress over the last 20 years in trying to move, I, I said it, and I know the members who are here may or may not agree with me, but but if you don't vote for trade for the right reason, if you vote against trade, uh, there is no political downside to do that. It is, in my opinion, it's a wrong position to have. I think it is short-sighted, but politically, um, there's very little downside to that, which is unfortunate. Um, so so I think we have to, on an ongoing basis, all of us be aware that, that we, we either got to bring the public along on these things, or it just gets very tough for the political people who are asked That's to put their heads out on the block every couple of years to do board this, board. Uh, right. and especially if the business community doesn't stand up, and not, not just when there's a fight, but on an ongoing basis and, and affect this. So with your employees, with your communities you do business in, with 
the general public. So, but the real message I wanted to say to Jim and to Ursula uh, and to all the members of the PAC on behalf of the President, thanks for taking the time and going through the effort of, of giving us advice. And uh, we do listen, believe it or not. People do listen to advice they get uh, great. from you. So I appreciate that very much. Senator. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Good job. Yeah, Bill, thanks very much. I mean, and we will take your comments to heart. Uh, particularly within the context of the current FTAs, we are spending a lot of time in our local communities trying to help get this done. Your, your point is do that all the time, not, not just when you need it. We got it. We appreciate your comments, Thanks. Bill. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, why don't we return to the, uh, to the order of play. I think business visas was the next. Where's, where's, where's Bobby? I saw him. Here I am. Early. Yep, Bobby. Bobby, would you please uh, present the letter? Sure. Thank you, Jim. The key message of the uh, visa letter is that we need to fix the visa and immigration policies in the United States to remain globally competitive over the long term. In order to do that, um, and the reason that is that the many of the uh, many American companies use, they utilize the business-related visas for entry of suppliers, customers, employees, prospective investors, and trade show participants, and there are real problems with that. Um, what we are recommending is that we facilitate the pro visa uh, processing for B visas. Uh, by cutting processing times and setting aside specific windows uh, at state for uh, visa, B visa traveler interviews. Um, we're asking them to streamline the interview uh, process and, and uh, visa process um, by waiving interview requirements in some, for some uh, low-risk business-related visa applicants. Um, we're asking uh, the President to uh, work with Congress to reform the U.S. visa and immigration policies to provide for um, H-1B visas and change those uh, limits and uh, L-1 visas as well as uh, in, in, uh, endorsing the President's uh, view of stapling a green card to the diplomas, to diplomas of highly skilled uh, foreign students studying in the United States. Um, we're, we're asking that the, uh, a trusted employer program be established and um, uh, lastly we're asking for the, uh, there be an informal private public working group to serve as a mechanism to improve transparency and increase communication. Bobby, thank you. thank you very much. I mean, this is a very important area. And I think, Jim, did you want to weigh in here, Jim Turley? Yeah, I'll be very brief. First, let me apologize for missing the services uh, event last night. Uh, I was actually in Russia with Vice President Biden. Uh, there were a few CEOs meeting with the Russian CEOs and the Russian leadership all around WTO Ascension and Jackson Vanek and all of that, uh, again, uh, an issue that benefits trade a great deal. And hopefully we can work together and move that forward. I guess it's stating the obvious to say that overall immigration policy is a difficult political issue, a lot of starts and stops. Um, that's not what this is about. <coughs> this is separate from the comprehensive immigration reform that people talk about. Um, our particular vantage point from Ernst & Young's perspective, we're in 140 countries around the world, so we get a pretty good window to what's going on here. We're one of the top, I don't know, six or seven uh, H-1B visa uh, users, in effect, each year. Um, I think the, the letter is very well put together, and Bobby, I'm delighted you're bringing it forward because I think it is incredibly important to move forward quickly on this. Um, I think separating out the business visa issues from the overall other immigration issues is incredibly important. Uh, the administration has already put together the right interdepartmental working group, I think, to make this happen. Hopefully the PEC can plug into that, Jim. I think that yep. getting the right kind of interface and, and having the PEC uh, be effective in, in, you know, sort of helping create the the echo chamber to make this reform positive is something I think we all can be effective in and so encourage the administration to use us to help in any way they'd like us to. I think your comments uh, nicely uh, pointed, s separated trade facilitation, export enhancement from the broader political issue. We, we've really got to get this done. So Absolutely right. Any, any, other, any other comments? Therefore, without objection, we will will adopt this letter as well. Thank you, Bobby. Sure. Appreciate that. Uh, Andrew, Andrew Liveris, uh, 21st Century Trade Template Letter. Thank you, uh, Jim, and thanks to the members of this Global Competitiveness Subcommittee. I mean, the name of the letter speaks for itself, 21st Century Trade um, and what it means. 
I think uh, Secretary of Commerce uh, Locke and everyone in the USTR, uh, Representative Kirk, knows that we, we tend to have the gold standard as a country and really the address to a gold standard approach to key uh, trade agreements. Uh, lots of countries can do trade agreements, but they won't address the gold standard. So this letter basically says that the vision is to maintain a gold standard approach on all the key issues that matter around market access, tariff eliminations, intellectual property, and investment property protections, and all the things that we would worry about as we do trade agreements. Clearly NAFTA was one of those back in the 90s. The Korean FTA, we believe, is definitely that and the Colombia and Panama quick follow-up. So the letter doesn't really speak to it exactly, but it's a strong call from the September letter to make sure we bring those three over the line in whatever noise level there is in the background that we've got to bring them over the line, Korea, Colombia, Panama. And then this letter basically says, let's go to TPP as the next big agreement for this country. And let's put TPP into the gold standard approach. And when we put it into the gold standard approach, it will address the concerns and issues that are out there on trade in general that Secretary Daly uh, really covered, which is an education issue which we all embrace. This letter doesn't cover that, but of course there are going to be concerns as we go into the negotiations. Just to remind you, Australia, Brunei, Chile, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, Malaysia, and Vietnam. As we know, I mean, these are all economies that transcend the Pacific, can give us a backdoor approach, not just to ASEAN, but beyond that into the China, um, into the China play. So the TPP is a tremendous opportunity to create a high quality, high standard, gold standard approach to free trade. And the letter really addresses that. It addresses it from a sense of urgency because we're going to host APEC, the US will host APEC this year. And we, we, we basically come out with a recommendation to create a working group between PEC and USTR to actually put together the frameworks and the specifics. The letter goes through a lot of those. For the sake of time, I'm not going to give you every detail that's in the letter, but the, the headlines, market access, non-tariff barriers, regulatory coherence, trade and supply chain facilitation, strong intellectual property protection, liberalized trade and services, strong investment protection and access, government procurement, transparency and corruption, how we address cross-border data transfers, and state-owned and state-supported enterprises that these countries have that tend to create a non-level playing field. Lots of address to the specifics, lots of address to how, to how we get into those concerns. The bottom line of the letter, and it's very much addressed, is that we move into this next framework ASAP, work with USTR, and get it going. Jim. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Andrew. I mean, the TPP is critical, and there's a little bit of a time fuse on this one because of the APEC meeting in, I think, mid-November at some point. And I realize we're, we're challenging ourselves and, and the USTR with a pretty big task. But I think what we want to underline is the importance of, uh, of regaining the initiative on these trade. The TPP, in many cases, gets us even still you know, in many cases compared to what some of the European and other Asian countries have. So it's, uh, we're, we're not stepping out ahead yet, all right? We're catching up still, and this one's really important. It creates, creates an alternative, if you'll forgive me, creates an alternative to China in terms of uh, access, for, <laughs> access for some of us, and that's a good thing. And that's a good thing. So uh, I just want to highlight the gold standard approach to that. So time should not be forsaken for gold standard. And I think if we, we, that's our challenge. And that's yeah. what the letter addresses. Thank you, Andrew. Alan, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, and thanks a lot. Um, it, it's just such a critical time for us. And the groundwork that we have done, Ambassador Kirk, with the South Korea Free Trade Agreement is incredible. We have put manufacturing back on the fundamental agenda. Everybody knows that around the world now, the market access now, and also with the core principles that are laid out in this agreement. It is the best that we have ever seen. I think it gives you a lot of just fundamental foundation going forward and to build on what you've uh, been able to accomplish uh, so far. And I think that the existing trade agreements that we have throughout Asia, this is the, the natural one to lump them together to take this tremendous step to catch up, as Jim has pointed out. So we are absolutely enthusiastically supportive of this Great. issue. Great, Alan. Thank you. And Congressman Sanchez, did you have something you wanted to say? And then uh, Congressman Wu, perhaps? I did, and uh, um, I, I had a conversation with um, uh, Senator Brown's office. Um, yeah. There are a few things in this letter that um, I think could be fine-tuned, and so I think there's an interest among some members of the PC to file um, additional and alternative uh, remarks 
uh, to the 21st century letter. Um, and I'm just going to point out one small issue uh, as an example. Um, while it talks about the importance of medicines for the developing world, it also suggests that um, for the TPP, the intellectual property provisions, um, sh it, that we should use the Korea FTA as a model. And I think when you're talking about access to medicines for poor countries, um, the Peru language is actually superior uh, to the Korea language. Okay. And that, that's just one example of, of some of the fine tuning I think that this letter could use. So there will be okay. a group of us that will, will file an additional um, remarks letter to that, to that letter. Well, I really appreciate your engagement there. And that, and that sounds right. Jim? Yes. Oh, do you have a colleague? I'll go after Yes, I was going to, uh, yeah, Congressman Wu may make a comment, and then we might pause for a second. Oh, no, with the Secretary. I have Senator Wu. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm going to stay out of the middle of this one, though. So, <laughs> Congressman Wu, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to touch briefly on agreements that Ambassador Kirk negotiates in the future, and that is on the potential role of uh, civil society and uh, protection of civil liberties which are enshrined in the host country's own laws and constitution. Uh, this is sometimes seen as a make-weight argument, but I differ uh, because I think that one of the things I hear frequently when I was in business practice is concern about the stability of the host country. And I don't think that there's much more that can promote host country stability than the than the gradual easing of some of these uh, uh, in, unstable regimes where one might go over a cliff. And mm -hmm. I think that recent events mm -hmm. in the Middle East and North Africa uh, illustrate how a, a gentle easing uh, might be advantageous. And I hope that uh, our Secretary of State might address related issues. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Congressman. A, a good caution that we will take under advisement. Appreciate that. And Senator Wyden, before Secretary. Thank, thank you, Jim, and I'll be very brief, yep. and this actually touches on an area where Secretary Clinton is doing very good and very important work, and that is, I think increasingly we've got to see the Internet as the shipping lane of the 21st century. I mean, this is how business is being conducted. This is how societies are organizing. Forty countries now are looking at trade barriers against American goods and services, and the only reason I bring it up, and Secretary Clinton has really championed uh, this, and we saw it a little bit in the Finance Committee hearing with uh, Ambassador Kirk. Keeping the Internet open is different than uh, protecting intellectual property. In other words, we had a big back and forth in the Finance Committee. This uh, uh, council is spending a lot of time on efforts to protect intellectual property. That's good. That's different than keeping the Internet open for commerce. So the work that you're doing in terms of moving cross-border uh, uh, data, that's going to be great. Secretary Clinton has been a champion on, on this. And to the extent we start talking about the Internet as the shipping lane of the 21st century, I think that's really going to help us. And Ambassador Kirk said he's going to try and make it a priority for future trade agreements. And I think that's where we need to be. And welcome, Secretary Clinton. Thank you very much for those, <coughs> those comments. Um, Listen, we, we do, let's pause for a second. We, we are very fortunate to have Secretary of State Hillary Clinton with us here today. Um, listen, with all this going on, the fact that you could take some time out for us is very much appreciated. I think, uh, you know, there is no more tireless advocate for uh, private companies around the world. I know from personal experience and the Secretary of State here, uh, I'm thinking of Vietnam, I'm thinking of China, I'm thinking of Russia, I'm thinking of a lot of places. And, we really appreciate it. And I know many people have had similar experiences with both the advocacy of herself personally and, and her organization. So it's great to have her here, make some comments. Uh, one, one, one topic that came up is, is visas today. Oh. You know, if you could, uh, you know, you've never heard that discussion before. No, never have. But, but if you could just touch on that yes. as you're in your comments, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. And it's wonderful to see all of you. Um, I, I, I am delighted to uh, be able to come and talk with you. Undersecretary uh, Hormatz is carrying the, uh, the water for the State Department and what we're doing uh, with the Export uh, Council and the President's uh, uh, goal of doubling our exports. And uh, I just want to start by echoing the President's uh, statement this morning about our concern and condolences over what's uh, happened in Japan. And 
what is uh, yet unfolding with the uh, tsunami. Uh, obviously, the United States is offering immediate relief. Those of you who do business uh, in Japan, uh, we think we, we've sent out a, uh, a warden notice. We think we've accounted for uh, most all Americans that we know of, but let us know. Our counselor efforts are literally 24-7 to make sure that we assist any and all uh, U.S. citizens and are supporting uh, the Japanese government. We just had our um, Air Force assets in Japan uh, transport some really important uh, coolant to one of the nuclear plants. You know, Japan is very reliant on nuclear power and they have very high engineering standards, uh, but uh, one of their plants came under a lot of stress with the earthquake and didn't have enough coolant, and so uh, Air Force uh, planes were able to deliver that. So we're really deeply involved in trying to do as much as we can uh, on behalf of the Japanese and on behalf of uh, U.S. citizens. Um, the State Department is a full partner in what you are doing, and we're proud to be a partner, and I consider it a critical aspect of my job to help open every market I can find and sell every American product I can sell, and uh, that's caused a few comments by some, but uh, I am absolutely shameless about it. So I not only like to promote our products and services, but our ingenuity, our creativity, and everything else uh, that we stand for. I think that uh, uh, we have given clear direction in the Obama administration to our ambassadors. We are working hard to turn our ambassadors into CEOs. Uh, that is uh, very familiar to some, but not to all of them. And we believe that having a CEO model for the chief of mission uh, will help us manage the myriad of U.S. government uh, assets and activities in, in every country in the world today. Uh, so when I uh, talk to Special Representative Lorraine Harriton or anybody else in our shop, it is about making sure that we help provide the tools that our ambassadors need to be able to do everything possible to promote uh, this mission about expanding our exports. Uh, the October 2010 tour by our ambassadors to the Middle East and North Africa brought them to Milwaukee, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco, and Houston, uh, so that U.S. business executives, many of whom are not sitting around this table, would learn more about how to export. It is still viewed by too many American uh, businesses as something of a, uh, a black box. They don't know how to get in. They don't know what to do once they do get in. And uh, we are working very uh, diligently with the rest of the government to try to promote that. I hope that uh, we can do more to encourage more small and medium-sized businesses. When I do travel, I try to do a commercial diplomacy event uh, in, in many places. Um, I was in Australia where we did an event with Caterpillar, John Deere, Harley-Davidson, and GE. Uh, when I was in Russia, I visited uh, the Boeing uh, uh, engineering facility in Moscow and witnessed firsthand the extraordinary cooperation not only between Russians and Americans but between Moscow, Chicago, and Seattle. Um, and in our efforts to promote small and medium-sized businesses, we've tried to highlight them so that, for example, Echelon Corporation, based in uh, San Jose, California, has about 350 employees. It's a world leader in developing systems that support smart electrical grids and other ways to make energy uh, systems more efficient. And they're exporting those uh, systems to China, uh, which is now using them to reduce water use and greenhouse gas emissions. So any of you who uh, need their services, let me know, because uh, we could use them here at home as well. Um, now, I do understand, as Jim uh, alluded, to the need to facilitate our visa policy. Last year, we issued uh, almost 7 million visas to qualified applicants around the world. In the last two years, we have certified nine additional countries for our visa waiver program. We are streamlining operations by eliminating paper applications, working to expedite uh, visa appointments for business travelers. But I'll just be very candid with you. Uh, we have tried some experiments to, to uh, look for ways to um, uh, do interviews over Skype. It doesn't meet our security needs. We, you know, we train our consular officers to look at a visa applicant from a lot of different perspectives, and it's unfortunate that that's the world we find ourselves in. Uh, so 
We're trying to uh, do everything possible to keep our counselor offices open uh, longer, to try to provide more support. Uh, one of my big pleas to the Congress in my testimony of the last uh, two weeks uh, was if you cut our budget, which of course we know everything will be cut, but if we cut our personnel, uh, our biggest uh, personnel load is in counselor affairs. And um, when it comes to visa waivers, there are very strict standards that have to be met by uh, the Department of Homeland Security. China, India, and Brazil do not meet them. And that's where a huge increase in visa applications uh, are coming from. Now, as you were talking about when I came in, uh, we are pursuing free trade agreements. Ambassador Kirk is on the front lines there. Um, we uh, hope to be able to get those agreements up this year, uh, starting with uh, CHORUS. Um, <clears throat> we think it's very important to, to uh, uh, go ahead and approve that, but also Colombia and Panama, and to accelerate our efforts on uh, the TPP. Um, I heard uh, the comment about intellectual property, and when I spoke to the APEC uh, uh, conference a few days ago, I said we have to deal with intellectual property in the TPP. That needs to be a model for what uh, we uh, need to do. So there's a lot that we're doing, and we, we would like to do more. We feel that it's part of our, um, our mission. Um, but I think it's fair to say, and you certainly would hear that from Secretary Locke, um, commercial diplomacy has been cut back uh, at the very time when we need more uh, people on the ground uh, making America's case for America's businesses. So we need your help to both for, for Gary's people who are uh, housed in our embassies around uh, the world working with our ambassadors and others, plus our people who go out and do open skies agreements which are going to create uh, uh, billions of new dollars in uh, economic opportunities and lots of new jobs here in America. You know, we're doing it every day and we need to do a better job and we need your help doing it to make the connection between increasing exports and supporting the mission of the State Department and the Commerce Department and USTR. Well, li listen, thank you very, very much for these comments. You know, as to your last point, um, one of our early recommendations was all about more boots on the ground. And uh, if we need to return to that to give you the support, and I know, Gary, you've, you've, uh, you've made, you've got some of your own recommendations in that direction. And so, but if we need uh, to weigh in, again, we will uh, readdress that issue because it is critically important. You know, when you show up in places and, and there's 20 Chinese boots on the ground and there's three of our boots on the ground up from two, you know, we feel good about it, but is it enough? We have to raise that question and that's, uh, and we'll do that. We really appreciate the advice and, and the push on that one. And uh, your commercial advocacy is off the charts. Oh. And we appreciate it. And we it's appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Did that answer any questions for Yeah, is there any, uh, any questions of the, uh, of the secretary? Oh, well, let me add one other thing. Yeah, sure. Which is, um, we are very committed to supporting economic activity in Egypt and Tunisia. Mm. And I'll be going uh, mm. to Cairo and Tunis this upcoming mm. week. And one of our goals is to try to uh, implement enterprise funds for both countries. Uh, Senator Kerry and Senator McCain introduced bipartisan legislation in the Senate uh, yesterday. Uh, we want to be able to fund those enterprise zones. We're going to use some OPIC uh, dollars, uh, some EXIM uh, support. We, we were looking at the full range of our tools. Uh, but nothing beats uh, private uh, sector investment. So we hope that even in the midst of the uncertainty, uh, people who are there will stay there and people who aren't there will take a look at what we think will be a really promising market if we can get some of the, you know, the burdens off of uh, the consumers and, and uh, the business sector. I think one question, if, if I could, since I'm, I'm bracketed by both of you here, that, that has come up and I think it's reflective of the group sentiment, is, is to the issue of progress on export controls, which is, uh, it's not an easy issue, easy issue to talk about, tough one to implement, and is there, is there a comment on progress there? Maybe like Gary yeah. lead off yeah. on that. Yeah. Well, actually, there's been a great deal of progress, uh, and uh, uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and, and Secretary of Defense Bob Gates and I and, and our deputies have been really engaged in this. It's a, it's a multifaceted uh, process. Uh, for instance, a lot of the stuff that's in the State Department, uh, various uh, munitions lists are being re-examined. Some of those things will uh, fall off the control list altogether. 
Some things will be, uh, uh, will be the subject of greater security, greater enhancement, because all of the export control efforts that we're undertaking must focus on enhancing national security. That's the number one objective. At the same time, that means, uh, what that means is that we need to build higher fences around certain items and decrease the fences on those uh, things that are readily available around the country that actually hurt our competitiveness uh, of U.S. companies that are engaged in national security efforts. And so uh, there's an ongoing process within the State Department to review their list, move some things over to the Commerce Department, enhance protections around other things that uh, are within the purview of the, co of the State Department, and then uh, delist some things altogether. Those things that are coming over to the Commerce Department, including the things that are already here within the Commerce Department, we're looking at easing uh, the exports of those by going to a license-free regime uh, if there are uh, certain items uh, going to, let's say, our closest NATO allies and uh, EU partners. Uh, so we're really into streamlining that entire process. But the ultimate objective, uh, which is part of the President's uh, reorganization efforts, uh, and this actually started over a year ago, is to have one single licensing agency, one single enforcement agency, and really one list uh, so that you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, is it State Department, Defense Department, Commerce Department. So we're really into the streamlining. But the agencies are working very, very, very well. Oh, also, on our, our, our license-free approach, we hope to finalize that and make that permanent uh, even as these uh, reviews are underway within the State Department, but the Commerce license-free approach uh, hopefully will be finalized within about a month and be, and, and be operational in a month. Okay. Well, listen, again, Secretary, thank Madam you. Secretary, thank you very, very much. Was there? Alan. Oh, Alan. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, Madam Secretary, uh, I would just like to provide you some feedback that your focus on the ambassadors and their leadership yeah. in every country we're operating around the world, we can absolutely see the difference. And not only the relationship with the United States in the country, but also their public-private partnership with the country itself on, on behalf of all of us. So thanks a lot for your emphasis on that. It's fantastic. Thanks a lot, Alan. I, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, we decided uh, to really focus on leadership training and networking for um, our ambassadors because a lot of our Foreign Service officers who go through the ranks are extraordinary career diplomats, but they've never had to run anything. Um, they, you know, they kind of maybe get a little bit of responsibility as a DCM or uh, in some other uh, line job in the State Department. But when you have to manage uh, personnel from eight or ten other government agencies, and when we do need somebody in charge in each country, because too often, both as First Lady, as Senator, I travel, and the ambassador wouldn't even know who was there from the Defense Department or USDA or Commerce or anybody else because that wasn't part of the overall responsibility. So we are really trying to expand that. We had the first ever Chiefs of Mission conference, I guess, in the history of our country uh, about a month or two ago. And so any feedback you can give us, I'd appreciate. You know, obviously, just as in business, some people are better suited to be CEOs than other people. Um, but if we can raise the, the level of training and experience so that people are filling those roles at a really important time in, in uh, America's standing in the world, it'll be, a, it'll be a big step forward. Very good. It's the best I've seen it. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Thanks. It, I and headsets that. half the battle. Uh, Mary. Uh, uh, I, as a medium-sized company, I would just like to reinforce that. Just a week and a half ago, I was in Columbia, and the welcome that we got and the help we got, both from uh, Secretary Locke, your, your uh, staff, and uh, from the ambassador, Ambassador McKinley, was unbelievable. They gathered um, prospective customers for us. We had just done our first big export to Columbia, but they gathered more customers for us, and uh, they were extremely helpful. And um, I, you know, I just want to also, with that, say, uh, meeting with customers, they, they did lobby me, my customers did, and prospective customers to, to you know, do what we can to pass this FDA I, because they I want agree. to get our products right. there with about 10% less cost, and I just had a package that went for $3 million. Well, this customer's thinking about buying another one, but that's 300,000 plus right. in just tariffs. So as we can work through the issues and, and keep Columbia um, on, the, on the hot burner would be great too. But I, again, we, I was overly impressed 
with all the embassy staff who worked with us in helping us get an open house together and uh, the ambassador was gracious to give us a few minutes of his time so thank you very much for all those efforts well I, I will pass that on but you know you make two really good points I mean one um, uh, small and medium-sized businesses need to be a specific focus of the export effort because that's where most of the jobs are in America. That's where we're going to see future growth in, in uh, many parts of our country. But also, you know, the Colombia Free Trade Agreement, they have a free trade agreement with Canada, with the European Union. They're negotiating, or maybe they've already done it, I don't know, Ron, with China. I mean, they're not sitting around. Mm -hmm. and. They already have largely tariff-free entry into our market, and so we're disadvantaging you uh, instead of trying to, you know, get out there and compete. And the only sort of encouragement I would uh, give you, maybe challenge is a better word, is um, we really have to compete, and all of you around this table know that. You're here, um, but there are a lot of places where I see the tide turning a little bit. Uh, you know, I don't want to overstate this, but in some places, for example, in Africa, a lot of governments, which as you know, play a major role in uh, directing their private sector, so to speak, uh, people are starting to say, well, you know, we're not sure we're getting such a good deal with China. Mm -hmm. uh, th this, may, this may be, you know, less than meets the eye. And so I think we now have an opportunity if we show that we are as hungry and willing to go out and compete as anybody in the world. Uh, and uh, so I urge that, you know, maybe through our department or through mm -hmm. joint cooperation with Commerce, uh, we can give you up-to-date uh, information about what we see as opportunities that may not otherwise come your way, and particularly for the SMEs. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, I pre appreciate it very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, uh, excuse me, yeah. Before you move, just let me say one, if I can quickly to bring to close maybe the discussion on trade facilitation, at least we have worked closely with uh, Andrew and his committee, and obviously a number of what uh, the items you articulated are critically important to us. But specifically, I wanted to embrace uh, what you had challenged us on TPP and just give you the comfort. The whole purpose of us going into that exercise was for once, we had a chance to sit down with our team and said, if you could look at the world the way we think it's going to be versus trying to rejigger, you know, a trade model we've been using for the last 30 years, what would it look like? Now, obviously, we're not going to get there, but just give you some assurance, our goal is being as aspirational, running as hard as we can. We've had five rounds to date. Uh, we have a sixth round scheduled for next week in Singapore that's a little bit um, up in the air because of what's happened uh, with the tsunami and that, but uh, you know, those sort of things you can't account for. Our goal is to be as close to conclusion as we can before the leaders meet in November. Don't know if we're going to get there, but that's certainly our goal. We've made great progress to understand where we're getting in these negotiations is now the hard stuff. We've done all the poetry, yeah. as we like to say, and we've all, you know, committed our love and fidelity to this project, but now we've got to get down into the, the hard nitty gritty. But I can't thank you enough that the information you all have given us, the challenges greatly informs our work. And, and we're going to talk more about trade um, um, with Director Sperling in the session he leads. So I'll save okay. the balance of my comments for that. Thank you, Ambassador Kirk. That's uh, appreciated. Pat, before we adopt the letter, one final comment. I, I just wanted to offer two sentences of uh, extraordinary support for the letter. We believe the conclusion, and, and also building on um, Representative Kirk's comments, that the conclusion of the FTAs have tremendous benefit for America's ranchers and farmers, as well as manufacturers and have goods and services. And of course, again, a front end of much of that export. Uh, so strong, strong support. Thank you, Jim. Good. Thank you, Pat. Can I comment on the letter? Yes, sure, of this course. This is the 21st. I, I apologize for being late. Senator Welcome. Brown from Ohio. On, on the 21st century trade letter, yeah. Um, I, I, I appreciate the comments of the administration and people around the table. I, um, my state, Ohio, is the third largest manufacturing state in the country. Alan, there's, they're a reception at they're doing a new uh, a plant tour of the Ford plant today in Avon Lake. Thank you for that, uh, with the new plant manager. Um, we're third leading manufacturing state. We're third leading export state. That's manufacturing and agriculture. We do a lot of agriculture exports. The, I mean, that's, that's 
surely the good news, the somewhat less good news, is that imports in Ohio are surging too. And I, I just, yeah. as this letter goes out, and I think the members of the House and Senate don't sign the letter, and that's fine, but I, I do just want a, a, a note of temperance for a moment, and that is that, that um, there's, a couple of, there's a couple of issues, I think, surround that as, as we talk about 20th, 21st century um, trade and exports. Um, I, I am this Monday convening with the Secretary's Health Undersecretary um, Sanchez is coming out. Um, oh, see here, I didn't, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't even see here. I, I didn't even see here. Secretary, how are you? To do a, a round table and a meeting with, I have, I have put together an export group in Columbus, so, or in, in the, around the state of people, companies that, that will um, plan to try to double their exports, as the President has called for, and an advisory committee for me, he won't be meeting with them. Um, I, I just a, a couple of notes of caution, though, is, as imports in our state and in our country surge also, and that is the, you know, the, the, the public reaction to this. Uh, every time we pass trade agreements, the, the, we all talk about the number of jobs it's going to create, but each time we pass a trade agreement, it seems to increase our trade deficit. Uh, so the, the, public, the public is not as sold on, on these trade agreements as the people in this room are. I don't mean to be a fly in the lemonade, but um, they aren't. And I think they're, that, so that, that means two things in response, I think. One, it means we need to be a lot more aggressive in enforcing our trade rules. Uh, we are doing that with this administration better than in the past, and I know Ron and Hilda and Gary and, and, and others have been part of that. We've enforced in terms of oil country tubular steel and surge with Chinese tires. It's translated directly into jobs in my state and around the country. And I, I urge you as you move around, especially in small companies that, that you know, the small paper companies and small tool and die makers that cannot that really don't have the wherewithal to come to the government and build trade cases um, that the administration get even more aggressive. And Austin and I have talked about getting them more cases and has uh, have with Gene so that those so that, that we really can enforce those trade laws. Um, the second thing is is worker dislocation. And I, I um, we have still not passed trade adjustment assistance. We still have not extended the health care tax credit. 155,000 people in this country, workers, have been dislocated that are not getting TAA because we have not extended the expansion of trade adjustment assistance. And, and we really need you to weigh in. I mean, if, if we're going to pass trade agreements, and I don't see trade exactly the way you do. In some ways I do, in some ways I don't. But if we're going to pass trade agreements, we owe it to the – and e even the, the most um, – uh, the, the, the most orthodox of the free of people supporting free trade acknowledge there is worker dislocation. People do lose. It may, it may be a net gain in jobs. That's probably debatable, I think. But it certainly causes dislocation to a whole lot of blue collar workers and IT workers and white collar workers and engineers and others. And we've. We, we need the business community, and I don't want to sound like I'm lecturing, but we need the business community to help us get TAA and the health care tax credit through. If we don't, the, the, if we don't we're, you're not going to build the kind of support for trade agreements that you need. The public is skeptical of trade agreements. You watch these campaigns uh, totally and watch what that. that means with China and all that, and, and it means dealing with currency issues, and I, I don't think that's part of the letter. It means dealing with um, it, it's, it's, we, we protect intellectual property as we should. We don't seem to have the same interest sometimes in protecting workers in the environment. And uh, I think that should be part of, of our efforts, if not part of the letter, at least part of our efforts to deal with currency, to deal with worker and environmental standards as we deal, as we should, protect intellectual property, um, and that we help those workers who are dislocated through TAA and through the health coverage tax credit. Yeah. So, my comments. Listen, as to your last point, uh, Secretary Solis, this morning we discussed it okay. and we promised her that we would incorporate well, support you. there. And you, uh, we really appreciate you weighing in there. I would echo your comments, and I have personal experience with the strength of enforcement efforts, uh, uh, USTR and others on our WTO case in, in Europe, which is an eight year slog. These guys were spectacular. And I think that's an example that can. Uh, motivate and encourage others to step forward, because it's not always easy as a private right. sector entity. So I appreciate your encouragement there. Oh, but we will take that one up. Did Ursula similar on the eight year slog, and, and yeah. uh, thank you for it. Ours was eight years as well. We must have had some. <laughs> There's a um, certain rhythm to these things. Rhythm, right, exactly. Yeah. So it's good, and, and I do agree 100% with your, we do yeah. agree with your points yeah. on worker assistance and intellectual yeah. property, the environment, et cetera. So yeah. yeah. We'll take that up. So. Um, without further comment, I recommend we adopt the letter.
Okay, good. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Gene, you and Mary, uh, the uh, trade capacity export assistance, medium-sized small businesses. You have the administrator sitting right in between you. So <laughs> That's I right. Think, I think the team, team looks good. Thank you. Okay. Um, on behalf of the SMB committee, I'm pleased to um, present this letter of recommendation. The, um, the subcommittee letter is presented in three sections. One, education, access to capital, regulatory, and cost burdens. I will present the first two. Mary will present the third. As we all know, SMEs uh, create three out of four jobs in our nation. Um, this, this committee has been very, very active uh, since its inception. Uh, we've held uh, five regional roundtables, the East Coast, West Coast, and the Midwest. Um, we were pleased with the attendance of the uh, federal agencies, leaders, the uh, SBA, XM Bank, NEI, and more importantly, um, thank the, thanks to uh, Mike Masterman, who really put a lot of work into this, and Courtney, uh, where is she? There she is, who attended all of those meetings. And so it just shows you that there's a lot of interest at a high level here, so we're pleased for that. Um, to achieve the greatest impact, um, the roundtables were focused on identifying solutions for the near term and targeted companies already exporting uh, in at least one country. Uh, the key recommendations include education. As the Export Promotion Cabinet has noted, coordinating, leveraging, and targeting resources of the uh, 28 million U.S. small businesses with the one point of access of the resources available throughout the, um, through, through the local, uh, state, and federal organizations engaged in export. Um, the other point uh, under this is that we need to take the NEI to REI, which means national to regional. Uh, to achieve the National Export Initiative goals, we have to go to the grassroots and formally establish, and I say formally, uh, establish support regional export initiatives and fully utilize public partners, partnerships. We need to uh, target the nation's top 25 exporting markets, focus on the 4.1 million minority-owned exporting companies who are outpacing non-minority-owned companies uh, growth three to one, uh, utilize the uh, minority uh, business development agencies uh, to coalesce all the stakeholders, uh, to hold quarterly meetings in a form, on a formal basis. Uh, the, the other item is to provide catalyst grants, uh, allow the use of the SBA uh, state trade and export promotion funds to support export development through collaboration of chambers, ethnic business groups, academia, nonprofits, and others. On-demand information, I believe the Senator alluded to this earlier. Uh, it's very important that we uh, step into the 21st century with, um, with technology. Uh, support all agencies directing all intel through export.gov as the primary portal and expand its web channels, channels, webinars, and add live chat similar to the Department of Labor's Ask Jan. And, and serve after hours needs of resource strapped small business owners. We also need to target underrepresented and FTA resistant sectors of SMEs. Ensure large exporting companies use of SME supply chain companies to support their positive stories. The uh, second item is under my uh, presentation is access to capital. Give loan initiation transparency and timeliness expedite the increase in lending authority from the Small Business Jobs Act, give finance trade training to community banks, including SBA, accelerating its work with Office of the Control of the Currency, expedite implementation of a new program like Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Initiative and SBA's Community Advantage that work through CDFIs. More underwriters at XM Bank, and also support young small businesses establish federal incubators, uh, extend the $50 million one-time funding for SBDCs through the Small Business Jobs Act to support 70% of the real activity that takes, an average of, that takes an average of five years to sustain success for young entrepreneurs. So Mary, it's on you. Um, and Mary, before, before yes. you begin, there's always an element of making this up as we go along. 
when you're done before any comment, uh, uh, Gene Sperling is, is, is going to weigh in with his presentation, and then we'll get some comments on your letter. We have a scheduling issue we're trying to manage. So, Mary, why don't you go through, finish, okay. and then we'll go right to Gene. Okay, very good. Thanks. And I'm going to talk about the third point, uh, point in the letter as far as regulatory and cost burden. Um, it is true that export compliance and policies and procedures are cumbersome for the small and medium-sized enterprises. And um, I know even at our company, we're medium-sized, we've gone from zero to five people who are only focused on compliance within the last 10 years. Our, our exports have grown, but we've also had to add a lot of people. And so our recommendations are that we continue to really look at how we can streamline and simplify the processes. Those of us on the lean or continuous improvement journey, we always talk about how how do you eliminate steps? How do you combine or simplify? Um, and I think that, that uh, I know good work's being done on that and encourage you to continue doing that. We also need to uh, really consolidate resources and market export.gov, which is just a great site to go to where SMEs can know where to get the help. And, and that really includes uh, more education about export compliance for SMEs. And I know, again, a lot of work has been done, and I appreciate, uh, Secretary Locke, your comments about the new export market initiative with, with the National Association of Manufacturers. And um, as chair of that organization and going into a board meeting next week, we will again make that a uh, make sure that that is communicated because actually a number of companies are already online and using these uh, the, the wonderful resources and that's not even just small and medium size also some of the larger companies um, secondly the cost of IP registration maintenance and enforcement is is often prohibitive for SMEs um, the cost for one patent in multiple countries can be anywhere from sixty thousand dollars to three hundred thousand I know in our company it's around a hundred thousand and we just had 27 patents issued last year, but we applied for nearly 90. We had apps in for 90. That's a big investment, and I think it's a good investment, but it's still a, it's still pricey. And for a lot of small and medium-sized exporters, they're either going to lose their IP in a lot of markets, or they're going to price themselves out of the market, or they're just going to forego exports. And so the recommendations would be to work with the WTO to simplify and reduce the cost of protecting IP, create programs to finance international IP costs, push patent pr prosecution highway program, and also possibly create an insurance type policy for SMEs that could purchase and really tap into the, these cases of patent enforcement. And then the third point is on rules of origin. Um, they are complex and sometimes inconsistent, and they make it difficult for SMEs to be export compliant or to take advantage of FTAs. Um, and our recommendations there are that we, we re really recommend that penalties dealing with rules of origin be made more uh, commensurate with the size of the company and also that we work towards similar treatment of rules of origins in all the free trade agreements. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And so we'll just hit the pause button just for a second. And uh, Gene Sperling, it's great to have you here with us. Uh, I, I know there, there were some follow-ups from the December meeting that you want to make us aware of uh, because we want to weigh in and support some of those. So, and I know you have some broader comments you'd like to make. Um, l let, me, uh, let me apologize in advance. Um, uh, the one person everybody here has to uh, <laughs> respond to, I'm supposed to be in that a particular office at 11.15. Um, so I will try to come back, um, but, uh, but, but no loss because you have uh, our leader uh, right here, uh, uh, and, um, and obviously Michael Froman will be uh, coming as well. So I, let me just make a couple of very brief points, and, uh, which is, you know, one, there's no question you can see the President's commitment that, uh, that exports are a, a key component of our uh, short-term and uh, uh, long-term competitiveness uh, agenda and the fact that they were up uh, 16 more than 16 percent last year um, uh, does show that we are on track to his goal of doubling exports uh, uh, in the time frame that he he had laid out uh, uh, previously um, uh, and so we're still very committed to that but but as I think you've heard many of us say before and most importantly the president say uh, we obviously have to make the case uh, that what we're doing here does matter uh, to the workers around this country, to the people uh, Senator Brown has to represent every day. And I've made this point before, but 
you know, uh, for those of us who were caught up in Seattle in 1999, that was 4% unemployment and one of the strongest job growth years uh, of that century. Uh, so it is not just a matter of how the economy is doing. There is a, a deeper skepticism that those who believe in an aggressive export and trade strategy have to be able to respond to and prevail. And I think that's uh, important for all of us. And I think the Korea trade agreement was an uh, important breakthrough in that light, to have both uh, the auto companies uh, and the UAW uh, both agree to a trade agreement uh, was, I, I believe, a breakthrough in, in showing that that is possible. And as we push forward, uh, we have to continue to keep that standard. Uh, uh, not all of us, many of us here would like to see a Columbia trade agreement, but we also have to be able to show that we're making tangible progress in important labor rights and human rights issues in being able to make that case uh, uh, that if it meets the president's values and works for our, um, our, our people. And that's why I believe as we go forward, uh, what Senator uh, Brown and I, and I know Secretary Solis and, and uh, our Administrator Kirk strongly believe as well in Austin that we have to have the trade adjustment assistance. I mean, that's, uh, 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 that's, that's a no-brainer. Uh, we have to at least be able to show that those things can move together, and that's really just a, 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 a floor, not a ceiling, in what we need to be doing to show that this type of exports are benefiting workers uh, in our own economy. Uh, I just also want to mention one issue that doesn't get as much attention, but that is the, uh, the need that we will need at some point this year to repeal Jackson Vanek if we want to be part of bringing uh, Russia into the into the WTO, or I should say that the United States will not be left out of the benefits that would be offered other countries. And this is not an agreement that would bring in the pressures of low cost labor competition or other things that make that often have made uh, trade agreements more difficult or controversial. Uh, and I just want to make sure that is on everyone's plate. I do have to run now. I apologize if I can get back uh, before this ends. Uh, I will. You'll have Michael Froman here, uh, who, uh, from the White House perspective, is really our lead person on a day-by-day -day, uh, basis and uh, Ron's partner uh, uh, with the White House. Uh, so you will, be in, um, uh, you will be at full strength. But if I can get back and be part of that, um, uh, I will. So thank you very much. It's, it's, uh, it's great to have you here. Uh, and we get it on the trade dislocation assistance, okay, in terms of our voice being heard there. We get it. Congressman Riker, did you have something? Uh, th yeah, thank you, Jim. I, uh, I'm sorry, but we just got called for votes, so if I could yep. make my comments yep, a little please. bit early and then I have, to, I have to leave and go to the other part of my job. Uh, first, first of all, I just want to uh, say uh, that uh, this is a, a little personal note to my good friend Gary Locke. Gary and I uh, have known each other uh, since uh, he was a prosecutor in King County uh, with the prosecutor's office there, and I was a homicide detective with the sheriff's office, so we go back a little ways. Um, I just can't tell you how proud we are of you, Gary, and uh, really look forward to working with you in your new position. Uh, also uh, wanted to uh, address uh, my good friend, uh, the ambassador. Uh, he and I have had uh, a number of conversations about trade and, uh, and recently appeared in front of the Ways and Means Committee where we had a friendly chat with most of the members about the progress of, of some of our trade agreements. And I know that his visit at the Senate side uh, wasn't maybe as pleasant as, as uh, he, he, he hoped it would be, but uh, I know we got a lot of tough questions, but I just got to tell you that working with Ambassador Kirk has been an absolute pleasure. Um, honorable man, very, uh, very diligent, compassionate uh, about what he does, and, and it's just been a pleasure to work with him too. Um, but I do have to, to leave you with this question, and, I, and I'm sure you can anticipate what it might be. <laughs> uh, my, my job uh, from uh, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee has been uh, the, uh, the whip to, to, you know, to count the votes on the Republican side for the Korean agreement. However, there is great interest, as all of you in this room know, uh, about Panama and Colombia uh, coming along with Korea, uh, or at least rapidly behind. But uh, I think there is an important uh, effort that we need to make here in ensuring that Colombia and Panama come along, because 
uh, as Secretary Clinton uh, uh, mentioned, we are losing market share as the EU and Canada move in. And I am in total agreement with the Senator on the TAA and others who have mentioned it. Uh, absolutely necessary to include uh, in our efforts and in, in, in making sure that everyone is treated fairly as we look at our, our global economy and how we move forward. So I know there are some outstanding issues, Ambassador. Um, are, they beginning, are they beginning to be resolved? Uh, how soon will that be if they uh, are looked at and being resolved? And do you see uh, Colombia and Panama coming along with Korea in the next, uh, in the next few weeks, hopefully before July 1? Thank you. Thank you. Would you like to respond? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Chairman. I mean, um, Rock, before you go. Well, no, I said, look, I've been called everything from administrator, <laughs> secretary, to some, so maybe you'll just call me Ron or Mayor. We'll yeah, just keep it, keep it we'll simple. simplify. <laughs> Listen, what, you know, what I have said um, over and over again, and I laughed, I did a round table with 20 uh, members of the press yesterday who was commenting on my dialogue with the both Ways and Means and Senate Finance, and I'll tell you, it's always a joy when I'm with members of Congress. I am astute enough at least to say that. Uh, but it reminded me of when my brother and I would get into fights when we were kids, and my father would look at us and laugh and say, I've never seen two people work harder to agree with one another than the two of you. So let me say this. We absolutely have a shared goal to make sure we don't lose one job, one opportunity, to sell more of what we make, manufacture, invent, raise to any market we could get in. That's what drove our work in Korea. It's what's driving our work in Panama. It's what's driving our efforts in Colombia. We are making great progress. Uh, but I would also, let me say a couple of things. The President just believes uh, that we cannot, in our minds, find a good reason to hold Co Korea back for all the reasons people have articulated us their concerns about yeah. Colombia. They apply in Korea. We were number one in Korea four years ago. Today we're number four. And Panama and Colombia are important. And, I, and I'm going to go into a little more detail with the members. We are making very good progress. But Korea is more economically compelling than the last nine free trade agreements we've done. It is ready to go now. We need to pass it. I mean, these are business men and women at the table. If you've got a new product, you've got a chance to be first to market. You don't hold it while you develop three or four more of the products. You get that out there and you capture that market now. So you absolutely have another good news. I, t we, I testified, I think, before you all, February the 9th. I gave you a commitment. The President had directed me to do just as he did with Korea and say, get to work. The next day, I met with the Vice President of Panama. The next day, uh, my Ambassador Miriam Sapiro and the team began negotiations among the administration on Colombia the next week. We sent a team, included representatives from commerce, state, labor, to Colombia. Um, yesterday, President Santos sent his team here. So, I mean, this is serious work for us. It's not gimmicky, but we want to get it done, but we have made it plain, and a number of you have spoken to it. We don't have problems about the value of trade in this room, but what has guided our work as an Obama administration is we thought we had to honestly confront the fact most Americans are skeptical of why we do trade, and they just don't understand it. And if my job was just to go past trade agreements, we could do that. But we see our larger effort. We have to paint a different rationale to the American public why this is important. Now, going back, one principle that's guided my work, my entire public service, is the truth is an option. And a good story, we got a good story to yeah, tell now. Yeah. Trade supports jobs, you can show it in every yeah. case. Exports are up, ag exports are up, we are winning. Manufacturing is up, Sherrod, in this month. Manufacturing is leading our export growth. Exports at only 13% of our economy are contributing as much as consumer spending right now. We punch way above our weight. And secondly, for all the reasons, to some degree, people think that our trade policy wasn't rational the last 20 years. The good news, we're at a point there is an asymmetry in our agreements because of the fact our tariffs are so low that just about everything we're doing going forward is going to be in our favor because they're going to be bringing tariffs down. We, don't, we can't go much lower. So we're going to win with Colombia. We're going to win with Korea. We're going to win with Panama. But we've got to make the American people believe that we won't sacrifice our core values along the way. And, and I would say this, our talks, we aren't done. And I would love, I keep being beat on just give us a timeline. Uh, and I tell people, what do you think a much of a lawyer 
or not, I would be the worst negotiator in the world to come out and say, oh, we're going to vote on this no matter what you do in a month or three weeks. That's not the best way to get a deal. Uh, and the, smart, the biggest beating we took was when we came out of Seoul, Korea, empty-handed, and American people thought we didn't do it. But the reality is move. we were not going to sign a deal that didn't address our core concerns, and we got a better deal that at the end of the day, you know, I still have a hard time believing I'm in Washington. Everybody acts like the only sure thing is Korea. Yeah. And you all know how tough trade is. But you have my commitment. We are working as diligently as we can. We are closer than you believe. The delta is, is close. But we and we're, we are, I don't want to overstate it. I would tell you because of President Santos' own initiative, a lot of what we're doing in Colombia feels like we're pushing on an open door. This is important for him. So, but we have an opportunity and I think a responsibility to show the American public that we will do trade, not just in a way that allows us to sell stuff, but reflects our core values. We do that, we begin to address what I know Senator Wyden and Brown always tell me, we gotta expand that winner's circle. Because this isn't just about passing these three, this is about TPP, this is yeah. about our broader long-term competitiveness. So how we do these is just as important as what we do. Well, but I'm, I, I just yeah. want to say, you're here. I just want to say thank you for your uh, commitment yeah. and your passion again, and, and we look forward to voting on those agreements. And thank soon. you. You were you were a great host when we led the uh, ASEAN trade ministers yeah. out in Washington. But you know, I tell you, you know, I can sell trade in Washington, uh, in Dallas. But uh, you, you, Sherrod heard me said my in-laws live in Detroit and Cleveland, and I want to <laughs> I want to make sure I can still go home and sell yeah. trade over yeah. there too. Thank you, Ambassador. Appreciate it. Uh, Congressman Riker, thanks again for hosting that reception last night, by the way. The Services Caucus, that was ter very good of you to do that. Appreciate it. And Ursula was uh, representing us. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. We're with you, and we just got to keep pushing, yeah. and we will. Um, small business, a very detailed, well thought out letter of recommendation. Uh, any comments on it? I think there was a number of comments that anticipated this letter of recommendation. Gary, did you want to say something? Well, let me just uh, comment on some of what uh, Mary indicated. Uh, sure. We at the Commerce Department are really trying to revamp our entire deli uh, service delivery system. We have launched what we call Commerce Connect, uh, which is a nationwide effort so that uh, uh, a small, especially a small business owner, goes to only one office and all the people in that office are cross-trained in all the programs of not just the Commerce Department, but all the federal agencies, whether Small Business Administration, Export Import Bank, Agriculture, Defense Diversification Programs, et cetera, et cetera. So this is our complete uh, makeover of being much more customer friendly, especially on behalf of small, medium-sized companies. The other thing you talked about, patents. Um, patent legislation uh, passed overwhelmingly in the Senate. Uh, we're hopeful that it's, it will pass in the House in a short period of time. It's really uh, modernizing our patent system and bringing it into the 21st century. But more importantly, um, within about three weeks, uh, we will finalize and announce that for a very small extra fee, uh, we will guarantee patent consideration uh, and action within one year. So, I mean, that, uh, that's something that, uh, <clears throat> uh, that, that has always been a goal of mine. Right now, it takes more than three years to process a patent application. And, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, what? No, not not toying with you. For, well, for Ford Motor Company, it'll be a big extra fee, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, and under the patent legislation, we'll offer a discount for small inventors. Uh, uh, so for uh, either two thousand or thousand dollars extra fee, guarantee patent consideration within one year. Okay. Because I'm with him. So, um, SMEs, one thing we are looking at, I just want to give you assurance that at USTR, we're trying to piggyback and be accretive to what Karen and Gary are doing. But we've heard a lot because of what you and Gene have taught us. And I just want you to know I mean, one example in NAFTA, we're trying to look at common language forms for small businesses. The thought of having to fill out something Spanish, English, and French is just absolutely a non starter. So I just want to give you some comfort in every form we are looking at. We're trying to look at the implications of these on small business, how it might help Karen induce more of them. We're doing the same thing through the Transatlantic Partnership. It's a big part of what we're doing through uh, TPP. 
So I just want to give you that. Uh, just one final comment, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we certainly would like to see if we can move the NEI to REI. We think the mm. grassroots is what's going to get this done. Good comment, Gene. Okay, uh, looking around the room, why don't we adopt it without objection? Thank you very much, Mary and Gene. Um, Raul, did you want to make a quick comment on the uh, Council Subcommittee on Export Administration? I think you had a meeting yesterday. Well, we did have a meeting, and I'll make it as quick as possible. Uh, we held our inaugural meeting yesterday. Secretary Locke and Under Secretary Hirshhorn were very gracious in hosting uh, our subcommittee, which is now 24 members strong. I am no longer the Lone Ranger there, Jim, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> we have a very diverse group, both geographically and from industries, and uh, I'm very pleased with the group that was put together. I'm certain that uh, they have the right focus. Um, Secretary Locke recently said that we have to put higher fences around a smaller list of items. I would add that that should be a much smaller list of items and uh, you know, we, we, we're going to define success so that we, you know, we, we need to have some measurable, accountable measures so that we know what the end game is here. And so that's what we're working hard to put together. We're going to be holding five or six meetings this year, one of which I'm going to host in Miami in the winter, just so we're clear, OK? <laughs> Right. I don't know how you did that. You pulled that. That was a tough one, all right? So anyways, that, that's basically the gist of it. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased. We have a, an actual subcommittee. We're focused, and uh, we're very geographically and uh, industry, you know, diverse, so we're ready. Okay. Thanks, Robo. I appreciate the update. Listen, uh, we, we now have um, uh, Jeff Zients. Uh, as many of you know, some of you met him yesterday. Um, Deputy Director at OMB, who's really been asked by President Obama to lead the reorganization effort of the U.S. government. Talk about boiling the ocean. He's, uh, <laughs> he's going to create a different impression when he talks, though, because I've had the experience of talking to him. But he wants to brief us on his efforts and perhaps solicit our help. Right. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, the President did talk about this in the State of the Union last month. Uh, it's been decades since we've taken a systematic review of, or done a systematic review of the federal government and how we're organized. And I think there's little doubt that if you were designing the federal government with a clean sheet of paper, that you'd have a different mix of agencies and departments. Uh, the President asked me to work closely with Bill Daly and with Valerie to do what, you know, really is second nature for all the business folks in the room which is to take a hard look at how we're organized to make sure that we are um, operating as effectively and as efficiently as possible. Um, our first area of focus, because the whole of the federal government is a big place, um, will be on the government activities that support increasing trade and exports, uh, the charter of this group, encouraging investment in the U.S. and improving our overall business effectiveness. Um, even when you uh, take a quick look, and we just got started, so this is very top line, uh, the problem f and the opportunity for efficiency and productivity gains uh, appears to, to be there. Um, the, if you take the trade terrain, there are 12 different agencies that are involved. Uh, that results in a significant amount of fragmentation of roles and responsibilities. And even when you look at a key functional area, financing of trade or promotion or enforcement, there still exists significant fragmentation. And, and not surprisingly, uh, as a result, some of these efforts, some of these individual agency efforts end up being subscale. Sub so you know, at a first look, uh, there appears to be an opportunity for consolidation or streamlining. Um, as I said, we're very early on. Uh, we are clear that moving boxes around for the sake of moving boxes around is always lo a losing proposition, and that the benefits of anything that we eventually propose have to be very clear and outweigh the um, obvious short-term costs. Uh, we are out and about meeting uh, with many folks in this room already, and uh, that includes agency leadership, frontline managers, former cabinet secretaries, 
government experts and management consultants, congressional staff, and, their, and, and the leadership on the Hill to get feedback on you know, what's working, what's not, what could we do better. Um, at the end of the day, the most important perspective here is the customer's uh, perspective. And in the terrain that we've picked, those are businesses, small, medium, and large businesses. How well are government agencies serving our businesses um, as customers? So uh, I know there's a bunch of CEOs in the room. I've already spoken to Jim and Ursula and others. And we want to understand how are we serving you as customers? Where are you experiencing, experiencing too much delay or bureaucracy? Um, how can we better help you compete? And again, I think it's important that this is across the whole range of industries and size of businesses in our country. So we're going to spend a lot of time here to make sure that whatever we recommend um, is uh, customer driven. So to that end, we'd love to, to talk with those who we haven't spoken to. Um, either via phone or in person sometime across the next few weeks. Uh, and then most likely to the extent uh, you've got folks in your organizations who spend more time working with federal agencies, we'll, we'll, we'll ask for those introductions. Um, we will keep the full group up to date as we make progress. Uh, just as of today, the President established a 90-day uh, deadline. So we, uh, needless to say, are, are very busy and it'll be a hectic next 90 days. Um, we're also, as we think through these recommendations, we're looking for improvements, and I know this group has already identified a lot that we can make right away um, administratively, um, as well as changes in the 90-day proposal that, that could require legislative action. Uh, so we'll work with uh, Jim and, and Ursula to uh, keep you up to date and uh, get feedback as we make progress here. I know our time's very short, but if there are any questions or concerns I can address, I'd be happy to do so. I think uh, most of us uh, have been around big organizations long enough to know that the, the dangers of not, not participating in a discussion with you far outweigh. <laughs> <laughs> so you will find eager people with perspectives. And uh, any, any quick questions of Jeff or uh, I've had a discussion with Jeff. I think you're, you're going to find it a very right-minded discussion that it's all about effectiveness as well as efficiency, and I think uh, our voices need to be heard here, and we had a pretty good representative group here, so I think uh, we had talked about this earlier, and uh, we'd all be glad to weigh in. Good, so we will so, be in touch. And then we'll look for updates. Yeah, did you have a quick question? Yeah. Yeah, I just, uh, one Stephanie. quick question. Um, I know part of this process involves an analysis at the EPA in terms of uh, efficiency and productivity. Could you comment on that and their engagement in this? E the EPA? Yeah. Um, it's actually not one of our early areas of focus, um, at least at this point, uh, as we've been centered on trade, exports, competitiveness. Uh, we haven't yet spent time with the EPA. Um, I was with Lisa Jackson yesterday at the Business Roundtable. And as we get deeper in, if um, that becomes part of our focus, we'll certainly uh, meet with leadership there and, and spend more time. Please. Andrew, Jeff. Uh, hi, Jeff. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. I, I just wanted to. Uh, bring Stephanie's point from another vantage point, Jeff, which is we didn't get a chance with Administrator Jackson yesterday to get into it, but what Cass Sunstein's doing and how you do it together is really key because global competitiveness is part of the charter actually you have, and this is what this, this organization is doing here, and the EPA and its various degrees of regulatory activity, some court imposed, some not is part of the Charter of CAS. Right. So, Absolutely. So, so in that way, it links to Stephanie's mm -hmm. question. So That's I just wanted to bring and, that and, to the And table. CAS and I are yeah. neighbors right across the hall from one another and talk all the time. And you're right. We should make sure that we are um, linking that terrain. Well, Jeff, thanks very much Thank for you. coming in today. And we look forward to working with you. Thank you. OK. Best. Yeah. Listen, um, one of the, uh, the last item on the agenda before a wrap-up has to do with some follow-ups from a December CEO meeting that uh, I think are important for us to weigh in on. Uh, Mike Froman is going to be here in just a second. Uh, may maybe we'll best use of Okay. All right. You, you want me to do it or you want to do it? Well, no. I'd rather have you do it. The, the sectors in the countries. Yeah, the sectors in the um, so we got, we got the boss to do it, so 
Austin, you'd like to weigh in on that? Okay. Uh, the at the CEO meeting at Blair House, um, the context raised by uh, by several people was, look, we have an export initiative, and we know that the growth of exports in the U.S. has been lower than in other advanced economies, not just in emerging markets, that, that we had a kind of a focus in the 2000s, a recovery based on very rapid consumer spending and quite a lot of residential construction and very light on exports and very light on business investment. So people raised at that Blair House event, we ought to have a, a more formal strategy document where we analyze, look, let's analyze by sectors, let's analyze by countries, what policies need to be done, what is the status of non-tariff barrier protections of tariffs, of things like that. This folder, Blair House follow-up, everybody got one or am I the only one? No. Okay. No. Not the broad group. Not the broad not, group, not the broad some group. people. They only just sort of, an, sort of okay. conceptual anyway, introduction today. We're and doing we're that. Take it That's up. what yeah. everybody said. Yeah. Do it, and so we have yeah. we have commenced doing that. It analyzes um, several industrial sectors: aerospace, agriculture, automobiles, and parts uh, and auto parts, medical technology, uh, renewables, travel, and tourism. Following what? What you guys from the Export Council have identified, oh, Mike is here, never mind. <laughs> Disregard everything I said <laughs> after Blair House. But <laughs> turns yeah, out, you yes, would have been very impressed. Anyway, <laughs> I said, they told us get a formalized strategy where we looked at countries, we looked at sectors. I told them what the sectors were, I told them it was based, the sectors came from a number of things that had come from the Export Council, and that is as far as I got. Mike, welcome. Thank you. And sorry and, to uh, it's a pretty good tee up you got. That's great. But I can't I think the follow better. through is probably well, thank you. we'd love to hear. And, and sorry to, to be late, but you'll be happy to know there are about uh, the representatives of 21 Asian countries over at the Reagan Building working on APEC and what we're going to try and get accomplished on trade liberalization in APEC. And so uh, that's where we were this morning. Uh, let me just add to what Austin said. You, you all tasked us with trying to come up with uh, bona fide whole of government export strategies. We pulled together uh, Commerce Department, Treasury, Exim, OPIC, USTR, several other agencies, uh, SBA, and tried to bring the expertise from the different agencies to the table on how to approach both strategic sectors and uh, strategic countries. And what you see is sort of the first tranche of this. Um, We'd like your feedback uh, as companies, as uh, industry associations. We'd like to get feedback from you as to whether we're on base, whether we've picked the right sectors, the right countries, whether we've identified the real obstacles to exports from your perspective. And we'd like to enter into some sort of dialogue with you about if we go down this road of pursuing these kinds of strategies, what does it mean for your companies and your industries in terms of job creation and investment here and increasing exports from here. So we are open, Mr. Chairman, to how you'd like to best structure that uh, mechanism for feedback. We've met with some of your staffs uh, separately, and uh, we welcome that, uh, well, welcome that feedback. And then I think we'll use it as a bit of a roadmap. Uh, President's going to Brazil, as, as you all know. Yep. Brazil is one of the countries we've identified here. There are several issues that have been identified that we need to nail down with the Brazilians if we're going to expand exports in key sectors, and we'd like to use all of our diplomatic and, and uh, bilateral engagement with key countries to try and achieve these objectives. Listen, Mike, this is important work. You know, as you know, I was, uh, I was in attendance at that meeting. Um, the, um, uh, I, I think what we would like to do in response to your thoughts and your, and your uh, urging us to engage is I think we're going to sort of take it set up a, a structure within the PEC to evaluate it specifically. We haven't done much staff work at this stage, but uh, what we'd like to do is perhaps give you some feedback in November when we next meet uh, on both the priorities uh, and some of the impediments and some of the policies uh, that may make sense in support of it. And we'll work with you in the meantime. So uh, 
I, I appreciate it very much, and it's 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 important work. It's it's a very interesting discussion because it often does get down to sectors and countries. I think the challenge on the sector side will be this picking winners and losers kind of issue, but I think I think there's a way to deal with that, quite frankly, and uh, uh, and I think that's more a, a matter of us getting over it <laughs> than you getting over it. So we'll uh, we'll dive into that when I get back to you. Thank you. I should say this, as I mentioned, this is really the first tranche. We've got several yeah. other industry sectors that we're produ yeah. producing. We'll get those to you as well, as well as, as, well as several other uh, uh, country and regional strategies. Okay, Mike, we look forward to working with you. Yes. If yeah, I could sure, just absolutely. add, um, by the way, I agree totally yeah. and have, I actually attempted to read this. Um, I was telling my, my support staff the other night, and fortunately, at 2 o'clock I fell asleep <laughs> because it was, <laughs> It was uh, 2 o'clock a.m. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, services is an important um, area to figure out how we structure services. If you want to go further here, which I think you should, how you structure for services so that you can get enough um, of the services industries represented so that we can make use of it. That's one. And the second is on IT and all of the IT company um, exports that we have to make sure that we capture as well. And it's easy to track planes and copiers and printers, et cetera. It's not as easy to track um, software output and, and these kind of areas. And, that, and these are fast growing and not really focused on areas. So. OK. Thank you, Ursula. Um, OK. Listen, um, that really concludes the business for today. I have a couple of remarks about going forward. Uh, our next meeting is Wednesday, November 16th. Um, we're also exploring the possibility of a shorter meeting on Capitol Hill with the leadership this summer, maybe a little bit of a focus on some of the new leadership. Uh, we'll be back to you on that. Uh, two more small, medium-sized business roundtables coming up, one in Toronto as a promise to one of our friends, and one in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, anybody who wants to weigh in, I know one company that will be weighing in in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, the um, Workforce Readiness Subcommittee is planning an event in Chicago, I think, on March 31st, if, if, um, if that's right. Uh, and that's right, Bill, Bill Height, who's not here today, is leading that effort. So I'm, I'm announcing to all of you that that will happen, and Bill will be leading it. Um, the uh, one thing that we haven't sort of put front and center is uh, the Commerce Department is exploring with some of our members a potential ad council campaign on exporting. I think we need to think about that. Uh, it's one of these things that's a good idea, but we should think about it. And, uh, and I think in light of some of the comments by Ambassador Kirk and others uh, portraying uh, uh, exporting and associated trade in the right light is very important. So let's, let's think about that. Um, the, uh, for small businesses on the PEC, uh, the, uh, the APEC ministerial uh, in May, that we may be reaching out, not, not me, but the administration may be reaching out to you uh, to participate uh, in some of the run-up activities. Uh, we want to make sure that typically has been big companies trade representatives, uh, ambassadors, but I think we want to reach a little deeper here. Um, and, and, and so I was, was asked to mention that to, to the meeting. And then finally, uh, we are considering, and it's in line with what uh, Austin uh, and, and Mike said, uh, we are considering a fact-finding mission, which is a little bit of a tradition for the PEC to Brazil Early, uh, early next year, uh, and sort of in the January time frame, we're sorting out the details. Um, but uh, Ursula and I will be trying to recruit a number of you to, to join us on that trip when we get down to it. It'll be a, it'll be a sort of a one and a half to two day trip that uh, tries to line up behind uh, a lot of our activities. Plus, also, uh, what, Raul, did you want to comment on that? Yeah. I just want to make sure you're aware to keep that on the early side of January due to uh, Carnival and all, because Brazilians, about the beginning of February, are gone. 
Just okay. Sort of move it this way. Uh, you You're telling us to avoid Carnival? Is that yeah. is that what I heard? <laughs> is that what I heard what you exactly? say? <laughs> yeah. O only if we're going to focus on business. If we're yeah. going the other way, that's a whole different idea. No, I think we're looking at we're looking at uh, dates that are a little bit before that. Uh, listen, um, I already made the, the comment about Gary in terms of how I feel about his leadership, uh, in not only this last job he's been in but anticipating the next one, but also many jobs before Governor State of Washington. And so I won't, I won't uh, rehash how everybody at this table knows how I feel about him, but uh, this is his last meeting. Uh, his leadership has been important. Uh, whoever comes in. Gary, if you can somehow cause the next secretary to be as engaged <laughs> and as provide as much uh, engagement and leadership as you provided, this thing is going to be terrific. So did you want to make some comments before well, we wrap you know, up? We, we've had incredible success over the last year uh, with the leadership and the direction of the president to emphasize exports, and that's why your work is so uh, critical and so important, because we need to hear from you and we need to figure out what really you need and what will work for you. But it's really uh, uh, the success we've had so far, almost 17 percent increase in exports in 2010 over 2009, and with a lot of the indicators already very, very positive uh, in 2011, is really because of the, the work of all the different agencies, and that was the direction of the President, for all the Cabinet and Federal agencies to really come together. And uh, so we've really had, we've been blessed by that. Um, and Lee Zak, uh, who's the uh, director of the uh, U.S. Trade Development Agency, for instance, she's been sponsoring a lot of reverse trade missions and focusing on development projects as well in other countries where U United States companies could be involved in those efforts so that, again, it's selling American-made services and products, uh, but in other uh, lands. Here, here's an interesting statistic that I'll just close on to talk about. Uh, the opportunities that we have as a country to sell more of our uh, products and services and creating more jobs uh, here at home for the American people. China recorded its second monthly trade deficit. Uh, in February, exports rose from China to around the world to other parts of the world 2.4 percent, while imports into China grew 19.4 percent, second monthly trade deficit. U.S. exports to China over 2000, in 2010 up 34 percent. And all of you companies here, uh, whether it's Disney uh, to uh, uh, all the other manufacturing companies and the, and the uh, engineering services that are represented here, make great products and services that are highly valued and in great demand all around the world. And our job in the federal government is really to help promote that uh, and sell, sell, sell. And uh, as I head off to China, Senate willing, uh, it's an extension of, uh, of uh, those efforts, but now focused uh, on one particular country. So uh, uh, we need to keep working, and we need to create more jobs here in America. Thank you. Gary, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Gary, thanks. God, Godspeed, and we'll see you, uh, the Senate. Senate conf confirmation uh, in place. We'll see you in Beijing. Great. Uh, this concludes the meeting. Mr.